Last time in phase equilibria, we discussed the one-parameter and two-parameter Margulies equations as models for the activity coefficients in the modified Routes Law equation. Today we're going to take a step back and talk more about philosophically and theoretically what, how those models came to be, especially in phase equilibrium for mixtures. Recall before the break, we talked about single component uh, phase equilibrium a lot. So try to recall what the phase equilibrium criteria was for a single phase pure component. I want you to pause the video now and try to remember there are two things that we used as the phase equilibrium um, criteria. In other words, we said that if uh, phase one had an equal property to phase two, we said that they, those two things are in equilibrium. So which two properties did we use? And recall that those two uh, phase equilibrium criteria that we used were equal molar Gibbs free energy. So in other words, we said that the molar Gibbs free energy of the vapor was equal to the Gibbs free energy of the liquid. That was one criteria for phase equilibrium. And then recall why we defined fugacity. Uh, remember why fugacity can sometimes be easier to think about, well, harder to think about, but easier to calculate and easier to use than Gibbs free energy. The fugacity of the liquid would be equal to the fugacity of the vapor. So today we're going to talk about how this extends to mixtures. In other words, if I have two components now in the system instead of a single component, can I just extend this and say that Gibbs free energy of component one for the vapor is equal to Gibbs free energy for component one of the liquid, or how does that work? And in fact, it's not quite uh, that simple. We can't just use these same two um, equilibrium criteria anymore. So first what we'll have to do is start by saying, start by expressing the Gibbs free energy. This is also a little cartoon that I drew to help us visualize, kind of similar to the one that I drew uh, last time. The only difference is I'm not differentiating here between liquid and vapor because I want to generalize and say this is usually good for any number of phases. So there could be two liquid phases that are in phase equilibrium, for example. So just say there's a phase A, which is rich in the green molecules, and a phase B, which is rich in the red molecules. And if we say that these two things are in equilibrium, what exactly does that mean? Well, when we say they're at equilibrium, we know that the... Um, Overall bulk compositions are not changing over time because even though this blue line we're going to say is, is open or some type of porous barrier, uh, so it could be uh, vapor and liquid phases again, for example, um, there's some, it doesn't prevent mass transfer, but we say that the mass transfer going back and forth uh, will all cancel out or the rates will all be equal such that the compositions are not changing over time. So you want to start by expressing Gibbs free energy for the overall system as a function of the variables that it is a function of. So we can say that the Gibbs free energy, so the total number of moles is uh, N is N1 plus N2. So we say, or N alpha and N beta. This is the total number of moles in the two phases and N alpha plus N beta is equal to total N. Uh, well, hold on, I'm going to stay no constant with notation here. I'm going to call this N1, N2, N regular N. And I'm going to say that this uh, Gibbs free energy is a function of, we know that it's a function of temperature and pressure for sure. It is also a function of the number of moles. So because I'm doing an extensive property here, so remember the G with the underline under it is the molar Gibbs free energy. That is the energy per mole, Gibbs free energy per mole. So that's the molar property. But when I multiply it by N, that is converting the intensive property to an extensive property. So that's why I have to say that this extensive Gibbs free energy is a function of the number of moles in system one and system two as well. And then recall by the rules of calculus, if I wanted to express the differential change in this property NG, I could do it by writing a differential there. So dNG is equal to, and then I take the partial derivative of this NG with respect to each one of these variables while holding the other three constant. So go ahead and try to see if you can uh, predict what that equation will look like. So do exactly what I said, where you take a partial derivative um, with respect to each one of the variables holding the other variables constant. Okay, there we go. I'm going to try and do this a, a lot more often in the second half of the course where I, I tell you what the step is and I'll ask you to predict what it'll look like. Again, I think that works a little bit better for learning uh, if I force you to become more engaged in the learning process. And also it's a little bit easier for me so I'm not uh, talking and trying to write at the same time. Surprisingly, that's very difficult to do 
uh, while you're recording yourself if you've ever tried it. All right, so we've got four terms here on the right hand side. We can simplify these four uh, terms using our fundamental property relationships and then we'll also define another term that I have yet to define. So let's start term by term. The first term, dNG dt holding constant pressure and number of moles. Well, if we go back to uh, way back a couple weeks ago, we talked about the fundamental property relationships. And I had a fundamental property relationship for dG dt at constant P. So the idea here is find what variable, what thermodynamic variable is equal to dG dt at constant P. And then we can make that simply extensive by uh, multiplying through by N. So which thermodynamic variable is equal to dG dt at constant P? That is equal to V. So go back in your notes uh, if you have trouble remembering where that came from and I can answer that question in our synchronous session if you still are confused about why that is. Um, I'm just gonna go term by term here before I simplify everything. So my second term, I'm going to simplify by saying similarly, dG dP at constant T was equal to minus S. And these are both uh, intensive properties as well, molar volume and molar entropy. All right, now what I have to do for these last two terms is I have to define a previously unused um, term. I'm going to define the chemical potential mu. So this is the chemical potential. And it is going to be defined as the exact same thing that is inside this bracket. So the chemical potential is defined as, for component one, it is uh, the same thing actually as partial molar gives free energy. So I also wanna review what partial molar means. So Gibbs energy of component one with an overbar is the partial molar Gibbs free energy. Recall that that definition is simply the partial derivative of NG. So partial molar anything. Uh, so if this was a V for instance, I just substitute a V every time you see a G. So it's the partial derivative of the extensive property with respect to changing the number of moles of species one while you hold temperature, pressure, and moles of the other one constant. So remember in the partial molar notation, this one was an I, and then this N was a J with uh, J is not equal to one. So again, what you're doing here is you're measuring the change of a thermodynamic property, an extensive thermodynamic property. In other words, in this phase one, if I added a little bit more moles to phase one, and measured what the change in the Gibbs free energy is, that is what this chemical potential is measuring while holding temperature, pressure, and the number of moles in phase beta constant. So given that definition, I can just simply substitute in mu one in for this term, and I can substitute a mu two chemical potential of um, phase two in for, um, for component two for um, this one. Uh, I just realized why I'm being potentially unclear. That is because uh, N1 is not the number of moles in phase A. N1 is the number of moles of total. So this would be like the total number of red moles is N1. Total red moles. So in this example, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine is N1 and green is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Total green moles. All right, so big uh, overall N would then be 16. So it's not necessarily moles in either one of the phases. So sorry about that uh, little mistake. It was actually a pretty, pretty big mistake, but thankfully I fixed it before the video is over. Okay, so let's uh, plug everything into this expression. And then also I can write this expression for either phase alpha, phase beta, or the overall phase together. So let's go ahead and do that now. So my overall system is DNG is equal to V 
Uh, da, da, da. No, I need to multiply it by an n, right? So I said I was going to do this. I could just simply multiply. I could sneak an n in there, and that would make an n out here as well. One more big mistake I just realized. Maybe you have caught it already. I flip-flopped these two. I did not check my notes carefully enough, so cross those out. dg dt at constant p, this is the one that is minus s. So I'm just going to sneak it in there. So dng uh, by dt o, uh, at constant p is minus n s. And then this partial derivative is equal to uh, n times v. So again, double check your notes from a while ago about why that is. Recall what the fundamental property relationship is. Maybe I'll just sneak it in here just in case you have trouble finding it. So here it is. I found the exact place in my notes going back. This is class four, I believe. You say that Gibbs free energy is a natural function of pressure and temperature. So therefore, I can take the partial derivative of Gibbs with respect to P at constant T and vice versa. This should have a dt there. Um, and then also by using the fundamental property relationship that dg is vdp minus sdt, we can substitute here and say that this um, coefficient on the dp must be a v and this coefficient must be minus s. So that's where that comes from. Anyway, back to uh, what I was trying to do, which was write one of these equations for the overall system and then write one of them for each one of the two subsystems for the phases alpha and beta. So dng is going to be equal to minus, minus ns dt. I'll put that in parentheses just to make it a little bit clear. Now, so I'm going to move this down a little bit so we don't get pinched. Um, plus NV DP plus mu1 DN1 plus mu2 DN2. All right, so try to now by yourself write the same expression for uh, phase alpha and for phase beta. Okay, here is the expression for phase alpha. Really all I'm doing is adding a superscript alpha just to denote that each one of these properties that I'm uh, looking at is going to be specifically for phase alpha. Ask yourself uh, quickly, why did I not write this? Why did I not write dt alpha and dp alpha? So take a second, pause the video and consider why I've omitted those subscripts. The answer to that question is because in phase equilibrium, Temperature and pressure are constant. So these two things, if, um, if I'm allowing mass to transfer back and forth, obviously then temperature and pressure must also be constant. That must also, must immediately be taken care of in order to have phase equilibrium. Not necessarily true for um, changing the number of moles of um, one of the components or the other. So that's why N1 alpha, N1 and N2 both have superscript alphas. All right, I'm going to write the uh, same expression for phase beta. Okay, now we've got three equations. What do we do with them now? So now we need to start making some simplifications. First simplification that I'm going to do is observe that this is defined as a closed system. So this thick black border around the outside is signifying that no mass can come into the overall system. No moles can come into the overall system. Therefore, I can say that the change in the total number of moles of species A and the total number of moles of species B, or one and two, those have to be zero. So maybe in a different color, maybe in, let's say, green, I'm going to cross those out and say dn1 equals dn2 equals zero on the basis that the overall system is closed. Uh, does not mean that dn1 alpha is equal to zero because if I have a mole that leaves, a mole of species uh, one, so if I have a red molecule that leaves phase A and goes into phase B, then I do have a change in the moles of species one in phase alpha. So these have to stay. 
Next, I've got three additive relationships that I can write. I can say that DNG, so this is the overall, must be equal to the individual changes of uh, NG for the alpha system plus DNG for the beta system. So this tells me that the Gibbs free energies for the two systems are additives. And if I have a change in one system, then I must, if, so if I have a decrease in the Gibbs free energy uh, in the alpha phase, then I must have a equal and opposite decrease in the Gibbs free energy of the beta phase. So the overall Gibbs free energies for the two systems have to be uh, additive. You can do the same thing for entropy and for molar volume. So I can say DNS is equal to D and S alpha plus D and S beta, and also the same for the molar volume. So D and V is equal to D and V alpha plus D and V beta. All right, now I can start plugging things in and simplifying. So I'm not gonna show you the overall steps because it would be a little bit lengthy. But the general uh, strategy that we're going to have here is this DNG, remember, is equal to this one plus that one. So I can plug this entire right-hand side of both of these equations into this left-hand side. All right, and then because the other two additive relationships have to hold, then this is going to cancel with this one and that one because those were equal and they're going to be on opposite sides of the equation. And also my NVs are all going to cancel because of that same additive relationship. So what is left over? Remember these two are zero. The only thing left over is uh, the chemical potential part. So if I write that part, I've got mu one alpha, dn one alpha plus chemical potential for species two in phase alpha, dn two alpha, plus chemical potential of species one in phase beta, dn1 beta, plus chemical potential of species two in phase beta, dn2 beta. All of this is equal to zero. Now, as I was saying earlier, there's a relationship between the number of moles of component one in phase alpha and the number of moles of component one in phase beta. In other words, this term and circle in red. This term and this term are related. They're not additive like the Gibbs energy entropy and molar volume were. Rather, if I have a mole of the red that goes from phase alpha into phase beta, I can simplify that relationship by saying dn1 alpha is equal to minus dn1 beta. All right, so any moles that uh, enter phase A of component one must have come from phase B, and therefore it's equal and opposite. So I could say the same thing for species two. So dn2 alpha is equal to minus dn2 beta. So I am going to make those simplifications. So I'm just going to keep the same uh, equation. So I'm going to change this to a minus and this to a. Uh, Yeah, change that to a minus, change this to an alpha, right? Because dn1 beta is equal to, the another way to say this, I could just write, that would be easier. That's how I was gonna confuse. So I'm just gonna substitute minus dn1 alpha in for dn1 beta. Same thing there, dn1 alpha. And now I can group terms because I've got like and like terms, so I can say, chemical potential one alpha minus chemical potential one beta, group them, dn1 alpha plus mu two alpha minus mu two beta dn2 alpha is equal to zero. And now I have an equation, the only way that this equation can be true is if either one of these terms is zero. So either one of the two terms in both 
terms have to be zero, if that makes sense. So either this quantity, mu1 alpha minus mu1 beta has to be zero, or dn1 alpha has to be zero. And same thing for the other one. So we cannot constrain that dn1 alpha is zero because then we could not allow for mass transfer to occur. So therefore, the only way that this equation can be true is if this is equal to zero and if this is equal to zero. And if that is true, then we have what is known as our chemical equilibrium condition for uh, phase equilibrium in mixtures. And this is going to be the basis moving forward. So you can think of this as like our, we start with the equilibrium criteria of the Gibbs free energy for the phases have to be equal for a pure component or the fugacities have to be equal. Or for a mixture, we've got the chemical potential of species one in phase alpha must be equal to the chemical potential of phase one in the beta phase. So it's the chemical potential is what the equilibrium criteria is for a mixture. And because we have, in general, more than one component, we must have more than one equilibrium criteria. So again, it's not the fugacities that we're setting equal at phase equilibrium, it's the chemical potential. So I'm just gonna write out in words the chemical potential. Remember that is mu. And remember another definition of what the chemical potential is. This is another example of like an abstract thermodynamic uh, property. Chemical potential is also known as partial molar Gibbs free energy. Gibbs free energy. Um, for each component is equal in the two phases. In each phase at phase equilibrium. All right, that was a little bit theoretical. Uh, make sure if you have conceptual questions that you bring those to me next time we have a uh, synchronous meeting. So that's the end of the first video.